garage when the truck fell off the jacks and pinned him underneath. Immediately, gasoline spilled out and a fire broke out. Fortunately, his 19-year-old daughter Charlotte was home from school on Thanksgiving break and she saw her dad and she still can't fully explain what happened next. Using what she describes as some crazy strength, she lifted that truck off of her father and pulled him to safety. Then she jumped in that burning truck, drove it out of the garage, and went back into the house to save the rest of her family. Now we've all heard similar stories, but how does anyone perform those feats of superhuman physical strength? Truly, we human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're body, mind, and spirit, and God has created us with marvelous systems and processes that when they're under the right circumstances, allow us to grow, learn, adapt, heal, and flourish, and sometimes even perform those superhuman heroic actions. One of those processes built into us is the fight or flight response, the survival mechanism built into our bodies that enables us to respond instantly to a, an immediate real or perceived danger or threat. That process pumps the stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol into our bodies and prepares us quite literally to either stand and fight with everything we've got or run like crazy to get away from the danger. Now, this is what gave that woman that strength, because I've seen pictures of her, she's not very big, to lift that truck all the way off her father and save him. The fight or flight response is a marvelous tool for survival. That sudden rush of hormones is there when we need it, and normally it subsides after about 20 to 30 minutes after the threat's gone. Divorce is a very real threat to your entire being and it ranks at the top of the stress charts. It too can elicit that same fight or flight response. Your adrenal glands pump out those hormones and put you on high alert. However, divorce isn't a 20 to 30 minute process, it's ongoing. It's an emotional roller coaster that seems never ending and it can keep you in fight or flight mode for months or even years. If those, those hormones remain elevated, they can actually damage your health. So learning to deal with negative emotions like anger, hurt, and grief is necessary to lessen the effects of that response and allow the healing process to begin. A few weeks into my divorce journey, I shared my story with a coworker. The intensity of her response just shocked me. She broke down and sobbed, how could he do that to you? You don't deserve that. Nobody deserves to be treated that way. Her face was just flushed and she cried and her whole body shook with emotion. And I kind of stood there thinking, wow, her response to my divorce was way out of proportion. And I knew there had to be something behind it. Then she told me how her husband had left her for another woman about 10 years before. He'd emptied their bank account and he'd humiliated her. Now eventually she'd taken him back and she felt their relationship had never really healed. Now she suffered chronic back pain, digestive disorders, stomach problems, severe weight gain, depression, and a host of other maladies that she readily attributed to holding those feelings inside. As I listened to her, I realized I could end up like this poor woman who was erupting like a human volcano right before me. Her story heightened my awareness of the damaging effects of suppressed emotions like anger, hurt, and grief. At that moment, I decided I wouldn't allow my divorce to destroy my health if I could help it. 
Divorce turbocharges your emotions and floods you with anger, rage, hurt, confusion, fear, sadness, disappointment, frustration, guilt, loneliness, just to name a few. So don't try to ignore or bury those feelings. They're very real. And you don't need to be ashamed of them. You don't need to hide them. But you can't always express them. So how do you deal with all that emotional overload? It's important to find safe, healthy ways to cope with negative emotions and stress now so you can avoid or minimize the serious damage to your mental and physical health that can happen in the future. During our divorce, my husband and I lived in the same house for several months while we prepared to sell it. After about two months, I ended up in bed with bronchitis for two weeks, unable to do much more than sleep and cough. And despite medication and rest, I just didn't improve. As I lay in bed, I, it occurred to me that I was very angry and I wasn't able to express that anger because he was still in the house. Maybe that pent-up anger was making me sick, but how could I get rid of it? I pondered that dilemma and I hatched a plan. Dressed in my robe and slippers, I headed for the garage and I found a pair of safety glasses, a hammer, and a piece of lumber about 30 inches long. I carried all of that into the basement protected the floor with a piece of cardboard because after all, we were trying to sell the house. I propped the board at an angle so it would break when I hit it and I started to pound on it with all my might. Every time the board broke, I repositioned it and hit it again. And I continued until all that remained were splinters strewn all over the basement floor. I didn't clean up the mess. I wanted it to send a message. And besides, I might need to do this again. Bathed in sweat, I returned to bed and slept. I woke up feeling much better and fully recovered within a couple of days. And I still view this as a healthy, empowering act that helped me break free from victimhood. Now it's important to know that people who haven't been through divorce may not understand the depth of your hurt and anger. When I shared this story with a married friend who never had suffered that same level of betrayal, she actually took a step back, frowned at me, and suggested I might need some professional help with my anger. And I laughed and I said, are you kidding me? That was the best anger therapy I could ever experience. Except for that bout with bronchitis, I took only one day off work for self-care during the initial months of my divorce. Sometimes it was therapeutic to go to work and forget about everything else, but I knew that type of denial was only a temporary fix. Eventually, I had to get away for some R&R. I wrote in my journal, I desperately need to take some long walks on a beach somewhere. A few weeks later, my sister and her husband invited me to vacation with them on Emerald Isle in North Carolina, and I jumped at the opportunity. I spent an entire week near the ocean with people I love and enjoy. We ate good food, drank good wine, rented movies every night, and just slept in every morning. But best of all, I got to take those long walks on the beach all by myself every day. You may not be able to get to the beach, but any change of scenery, a trip to a local park, a stroll through a garden, even a spin through the mall can help. We all have ways to cope with stress and negative emotions. Some of these can be helpful, but some can become lifelong problems. I have a friend who became a full-blown alcoholic after her divorce. 
because she used alcohol as a means to escape from and deaden her pain. I love sweets, particularly chocolate, and food's about the first thing I reach for when I'm stressed out. I also enjoy an occasional beer or glass of wine. In my emotional turmoil, I was tempted to reach for a drink or a giant hot fudge sundae or anything to comfort me and take the edge off of my pain. However, I realized that the breakup of my marriage was a greater trauma than I'd ever experienced, and it wouldn't be over for a long time. That realization forced me to recognize the fragility of my own health. Less than two years earlier, we'd moved both of my ailing parents into our house for six months and then into a nursing home. My father had died six months later. That year put a significant strain on my physical and mental health. It took months to get my blood pressure back under control and I still would spontaneously break out in hives. I knew I needed to take the stress of my divorce seriously or I'd be in big trouble. Short-term feel-good fixes, although sometimes necessary, could also create long-term problems that would only make my situation worse. With those concerns in mind, I decided to pay attention to what I fed my body to make sure I ate healthy meals and limited my sweets. I made it a point not to drink alcohol during that time, except for an occasional glass of wine with family or friends. My brain was foggy enough without adding alcohol to the mix, and I certainly didn't need its depressant effects. The severe stress caused by the breakup of your marriage puts your overall health in danger. Sustained elevated levels of those stress-induced hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, the body's fight or flight response, can put you at risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, lowered immune response, digestive disorders, headaches, and a long list of other health-threatening conditions. Divorce steals plenty from you. Don't let it steal your health also. Our bodies speak a language all their own, and they often tell a story that reflects what's happening in our lives. For example, my husband's infidelity made no sense to me. And a few weeks into my own journey, I lost my senses of smell and taste. Visual migraines caused me to lose much of the vision in both eyes for about 30 minutes at a time, and sometimes multiple times a day. My sleep was erratic, interrupted by vivid, wild dreams that left me exhausted. Divorce made me lose my place in the world. And I also seemed to lose my kinetic sense, my sense of my body's position in space, physically as well as metaphorically. One week, I broke my big toe on the open dishwasher door, and a few days after that, I sliced open the back of my hand, just reaching into a closet. A friend in healthcare cautioned me that high cortisol levels could be causing my symptoms, and she advised me that rest and exercise could help dissipate those levels. Normally, I'm not a big fan of exercise. In fact, I'm a bit of a slug. But my physical symptoms scared me, and I knew I had to do something to relieve them. So I found a small family-owned gym that catered to the over, over 50 crowd, where my cellulite and spider veins wouldn't look too out of place. And I signed up to meet weekly with a trainer. I knew I needed the accountability to make me stick to a program that would net the results that I wanted. And besides, it had been years since I set foot in a gym and I had no idea how to use the equipment without risking injury or looking like an absolute fool. At the same time, I also added daily walks to my routine. Pretty soon, that regular exercise started to pay off. Over the next few months, my sleep improved, my visual migraines dissipated and eventually disappeared, 
and my senses of smell and taste came back. My overall sense of wellness and wholeness began to return to normal, and I started to feel more like myself. I even changed my mindset from, I have to go to the gym today, to I get to go to the gym today. And that in itself was a minor miracle. Your body is as much a part of you as your mind, your heart, and your soul. It's not just a shell. It'll be raised and glorified for all eternity. Even if you haven't been to a gym in years, take that first step to engage in some sort of exercise. You need to burn off those extra stress hormones. In the long run, you'll be glad you did. Now all this is fine and good, but what do you do when everything is just too much? When the losses, the challenges, and the stresses and sorrows of life just seem too overwhelming to bear, and you want nothing more than to crawl back into bed and pull those covers right up over your head. Once in a while, it's okay to do that. And in fact, it can be therapeutic. However, you can't stay there. Life goes on, and you must find your way back into it. Sometimes that means you take baby steps small, deliberate efforts to find reasons to stay in the game. An appreciation list can be a good start. You've probably heard of a gratitude journal, a book you can use to record the things that make you grateful. That's okay, but sometimes that sounds too formal and intimidating. Maybe it's hard for you to find anything to feel thankful about right now. Instead, start a list on a single sheet of paper or even the back of an envelope. Start by writing down three of the most basic things that make your life more comfortable or easier. Things like hot water, indoor plumbing, a microwave. Think about different areas of your life and continue to expand your list. Particular friends or family, places you like to visit, music you enjoy. This list is only for you. There are no right or wrong answers. You can crumple it up and throw it away if you want. Nobody's standing over you to judge you. The whole purpose of this exercise is to help you get back into the present moment, to see that there's still some good left in your life, even if the sadness of your divorce has overshadowed it. As you search for reasons to be grateful, your attitude shifts from scarcity to abundance. And that allows you to, uh, to release your fear of loss and open your hands to receive more blessings. Sometimes we don't want to let go of our anger and pain. For a while, I wanted to hang on to mine as if it were a physical thing that I could hold and examine. I wanted to look at it from all angles. I think that's part of the healing process, to acknowledge the extent of our losses and our injuries so that we can grieve them and eventually release them. It's easy to become stuck there though. There's a lot of energy and positive feedback that come from self-righteous anger. Actually, hanging on to pain and persistent negative emotions can become an addiction. I recently heard a talk by a neuroscientist who said that persistent negative thoughts light up the same part of our brain that responds to cocaine. They actually produce endorphins that make us feel better. But as with other addictions, that's only a temporary fix. And it takes more and more of those negative thoughts and emotions to make us feel better. That may explain why some people still live in the pain of losing their spouse even years after their spouse has died or they've been divorced. And why some people choose to continually dwell on everything they've lost. It's easy to get caught up in negative thought patterns. 
I had a terrible problem with imaginary conversations and sometimes I still battle them. Typically, I'm on autopilot in the morning when I first wake up. My husband and I used to shower together every morning and so it's not surprising that my mind plays imaginary conversations during my morning routine. And that used to go on almost for two years after my divorce. The same mental monologue would kick in. I'd address him with a few choice words and then berate him for his behavior and ultimately always end up with that same question, why? That constant mental battle exhausted me and it set a lousy tone for the rest of the day, but I couldn't seem to break that, that cycle. Eventually, I stuck the words, let go, on my bathroom mirror in little pretty blue plastic letters. But even that didn't stop the script that played in my head. Was it me? Why didn't you love me? What's wrong with me? My ego had taken a huge hit. One day, as I stepped out of the shower, I heard birds singing outside my bathroom window and their song was beautiful. I stopped to enjoy it and it occurred to me that they'd probably been singing there many mornings, but I'd failed to hear it because I was listening to all those negative thoughts and imaginary conversations playing in my head. What else had I missed? Well, I'd allowed those negative, unproductive thoughts to hijack my mind. Maybe it was time to make a conscious effort to control my thoughts rather than relinquish that power to forces that always led me into a downward spiral. I resolved to fight back and be intentional about my thinking and mindful of my surroundings. I tried to engage my senses during my morning routine. A shower, soap, lotion, cosmetics, those are all very sensual experiences when I don't drift into autopilot. Imaginary conversations and negative thought loops can't kick in as easily if I stay aware of my environment. And when they do invade, I consciously reroute those thoughts to the luxury of the warm water on my skin, the fragrance of my shampoo, the softness of the towel, anything that brings me back into that present moment. Sometimes I add music or a podcast to the experience, but I, I still listen for those birds outside my window. So what are the takeaways from this talk? Number one, divorce turbocharges your emotions and that stress activates the fight or flight response in your body. Number two, the ongoing flood of stress hormones can have serious long-term negative effects on your physical and mental health. Number three, you can make healthy choices to dissipate those hormones and minimize their harmful effects. And number four, you can break the cycle of negative thoughts and emotions and imaginary conversations. My book, You Are Still Beloved, goes into all of this in more depth. And on my website, I have a free guide that says seven actions to help you heal. We think of the heart as the seat of our emotions. After divorce, your heart's bruised and broken and your emotions are in a state of turmoil. But you can make choices to help you heal in body, mind, and spirit. Place your wounded, scared, and scarred heart into the pierced, sacred heart of Jesus and ask him for healing with this prayer. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Uh, so what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to turn off the record.